then at the transverse process level, like you move the transducer below the rib, and this is the window that has been described in the literature. And you will see here, this is how the window is created, you know, the transverse process. But as you can see here, that the triangular paravertebral space is in the, in the shadow of the transverse process. Okay, this is the, what you find and what you will see in the transverse scan. You can see here, there is the, this is the midline, this is lateral. You can see the transverse process, which is posterior directed, the shadow, and the, the sliding pleura with the triangular space. So yes, you can guide your needle from a lateral to medial and place your local anesthetic here. It's perfectly fine. Uh, but really, if it is possible that you could see the paravertebral space, wouldn't that be better? Because you could see, uh, you could, you could see how, the, how the local anesthetic is spreading. And I think this is one of the very important things when you're doing uh, region anesthesia using ultrasound because if you can see the spread of the local anesthetic, it is, it is not an intravascular injection. So you always use a test injection of saline before you inject your local anesthetic. So this is our experience from the Chinese university. We perform the injection at the articular process. So you may say, what is the articular process? Well, it's just looking at you there. You need to slide the transducer slightly caudal and medial. Now you are in the intertransverse space. The osseous element you are seeing here is the articular process. How does the articular process relate to the intervertebral foramina? You can see here the inferior articular process, which articulates with the superior article and forms the facet joints, are closely related to the intervertebral foramina. This is the foramina through which the nerve emerges. So if I can insonate the articular process, then I can see the paravertebral space. So this is our hypothesis, and we have performed these scans, and we have done these techniques. Now, this is what you see here. Where is the shadow? It has disappeared. You are able to see the articular process here. You are able to see the thick ligament, and this is the internal intercostal membrane laterally. This is the parietal pleura, and this is the triangular paravertebral space. Actually, you can see the anterior lateral reflection, medial reflection of the pleura because it goes on top of the vertebral body anteriorly. So this is the entire paravertebral space that we are seeing. So you are very fortunate to see some of the early pictures of the true paravertebral space. Yes, even in an MRI and CT, I can show you that it is, this is the paravertebral space and how it is related to the intervertebral foramina. You can see the spinal arteries emerging or entering the spinal canal. So this is a no-go zone. Remember, that's where the dural sleeve is. This is where the spinal arteries are. So one has to perform the injection somewhere in the midpoint or in the, in the lateral aspect of this space. OK, we have been doing in-plane techniques <clears throat> where we also insert the needle in this direction. And we point it to this part of the uh, paravertebral space. And once you inject the local anesthetic, you will see distribution of the drug in the space. It's always preceded by a, a, a small aliquot of saline, one or two cc's of saline. As you can see here, the needle is emerging, and it enters the paravertebral space. Uh, as you will see in a short while, the needle is now engaged. It's just been withdrawn. It's, uh, it's, it's a steep angle of insertion. So using echogenic needles are desirable. So you can see here the tip of the needle. And once you inject your saline, you can see there will be some pleural displacement. And as you inject the drug, you'll see anterior displacement. Yes, you can do it at T3. You inject 20 cc's. You will get about three to four dermatomes. That's adequate. And I showed you in that study that it provides long-term effects. So if you knew this information and you went to your, in your operating room and you did a breast surgery, it's very simple, actually. You can put a laryngeal mask, general anesthesia, opioid. If you don't care what happens post-op, it's very simple. But if you do a paravertebral block, you will get acute advantages in the acute post-op period, including in the, in, the, in, the, in the long term. Actually, we have been performing multi-level paravertebral blocks as for surgical anesthesia uh, in an effort to see if paravertebral blocks as described can be effective for surgical anesthesia as described in the literature. There are many publications that says multi-level paravertebral blocks are adequate for surgical anesthesia. Is it true? So this is our conduct of anesthesia. Now, this is another secret I will tell you that when you perform lumbar epidurals or spinals, I told you, I explained to you how you can identify a given lumbar interspace, right? Similarly, we worked out another system of determining a given thoracic transverse process or a thoracic spinous, uh, spinal level, intervertebral level. 
The principal bill uh, is in, is, it relies on identification of the C7 T1 into a, a junction. What do I mean by that? We first perform a scan at the level of the ribs. You can see from posteriorly, you locate the, T, the rib one and rib two, and then you move it, move the transducer medially, and then you will start to see the C7 vertebra, C7 transverse process. Once you identify the C7 transverse process, you can count C7, T1, 2, 3, 4. So if you're doing a T5, 6 epidural, that's how you can locate it. So as you can see here, this is the first and second rib. If I move medially, the C7 transverse process appears in this uh, generated image. It's very easy to study this in a, in a, in a PAC system where you can uh, get the data and uh, render it in your comfort of your office. And you can see here that once you see the first and second rib and you go more medially, you see the facet joints, and then you start to see the C7. So this is the basic validation, and this is what we do. We position them laterally because we sedate them. Uh, we sedate them with dexmedetomidine. They also receive a small bolus of ketamine, 10 to 20 milligrams, to, to facilitate the block uh, in the multi-level blocks. So here you can see here, you're seeing the first and second rib. This is cranial, this is caudal. And as you go medially, you will start to see the first and second transverse process, and then a third shadow appears cranially. The shirt, third shadow that you see is C7, and thereby you can, you can count, you can mark a point on the skin and say this is C7, T1, 2, so and so forth. There are some limitations of that, like lumberization and circularization. So I think uh, if we validate this with CT, MRI, I think the accuracy would be much better than if you just use palpation. So what are the ergonomics? Sitting positions are, are satisfactory, but if you do multi-level, they are painful uh, because there are multiple injections. So uh, sedating them and giving them some comfort with the analgesia is, is of paramount importance. Yeah, since I'm right-handed, I always have the patient on the on the left lateral position if I'm doing a right-sided block. If I'm doing a left-sided block, I have the head to my right so that I can still continue to use my right hand. It's very important when you're doing this difficult intervention. This is the sedation we start, dexmedetomidine at 0.5. We don't bolus it. We give an initial dose of midazolam, one or two milligram, as the induction of sedation, and then the dexmedetomidine catches up in a short while. Strict aseptic precautions. Uh, this is uh, show you just at the T3 level how the transducer is positioned. Uh, look how I, I hold my hand. This is the anchor. This is one of my fellows doing it. But you can see that she has anchored her fingers and they're doing the block in an in-plane technique, starting from caudocranial direction. It's an in-plane technique as the needle is being introduced. And the ergonomics, you see the machine on the other side. Patients are monitored and is breathing spontaneously. Uh, remember, they are sedated, so if they're elderly, they may get obstructed sometimes. But with dexmedetomidine, we find this is least of the problem now. Unlike when we are using propofol for sedation, when propofol causes a lot of respiratory obstruction. Okay, thereafter, uh, you need an assistant to perform the injection because uh, it, uh, it, it just uh, facilitates the, uh, the entire process. So these are basically how we do it. Uh, and uh, you perform the injection in plane, the needle is inserted. Uh, in this ergonomics, and life would be very easy if it was so simple. There's always a hurdle in front of you when you find something simple, they say. As we perform the injection cranially, you will find, because of the anatomical arrangement of the transverse processes, the images you see slowly start to degrade. I believe there are two reasons. One is the pleura actually reflects a lot more away as the dome of the pleura comes. It moves away from the, from the paravertebral space. Second is, because of the alignment of the transverse process. If you do a transverse proc scan here, it can, it can do a true transverse scan of this. But as you go more carefully, you can see more anisotropy comes in because the beam is more at an angle to the rib. So what we found is, as you scan more carefully, you need to have a caudal direction of your transducer in order to bring the beam at right angle to the pleura. What do I mean by that? As you see here, we're performing the scan but as you tilt the probe more cranially, the pleura becomes more visible. This is at about T3, T2 level, T2 level in this case. And again, at T3 also you will see, as you tilt the probe more medially, uh, cranially, sorry, uh, caudally, you have to have a slightly caudal directed transducer, you see the paravertebral space. So T3 to T1 injections are very challenging because they are more deeper in location and they can be more challenging. But it can be used for major breast cancer surgery. As you see here, this is a patient been sedated, is listening to music, uh, and they are sedated so that they are awake and um, uh, awake sedation. 
Uh, and you can see here the breast is being peeled off the pectoralis major muscle. Uh, and uh, they require some rescue analgesia in trioplis sometimes uh, because of uh, when they work on the, on, the, on the pectoral muscle. And I will allude to that in the next minute. Uh, you monitor them. Uh, and we also found some vagaries when you do paravertebral blocks in the upper region. Can you see there are two pleural lines here? When you inject local anesthetic behind the pleura, we start to see a mirror artifact. Can you see that mirror artifact there? Now this is important because if you've done an injection in T3 and you are scanning T2, and if you see this picture where you're seeing two pleural lines, now which is the true pleura? Is this the pleura or this is the pleura? So that becomes more confusing. Actually, this is the true pleura. This is actually an artifact in the substance of the lung. So remember that the, the pleura, that, the image that you see close to you is the true pleura. And various mechanisms are there. Uh, and I think if you read your physics, you will, uh, you will understand that uh, any highly uh, uh, reflective surface like the pleura and the, in this case, the ligament causes a repeated bouncing of the, of the, tr of the, of the sound like reverberation artifact and produces that mirror. Clinically, we found when we did this in our first 25, 30 patients, today we have done more than 1,000 uh, single, sh you know, multi-level paravertebral injections as a single injection. We haven't had any complication to date. But in the first 25 that we systematically looked at it, fairly average uh, T1 to T6, uh, we monitored them uh, with, with sedation and so and so forth. We found that actually about 80% of these patients require rescue analgesia. Rescue analgesia during during dissection of the, of the pectoral muscle. And this is very consistent. They would not complain of pain when they are operating on the skin, they're reflecting the upper part, but the moment they put the diathermy and they, you know how they do it, they remove the, the, the fatty tissue, from, breast tissue from the pectoral muscle, and as the muscle contracts, the patient starts to feel pain. It can be circumvented by 10 to 20 milligrams, a small boluses of ketamine, uh, and once the breast has been removed from the pectoral muscle, the patients do not have. So the question is, uh, why are these patients complaining of pain when they are operating on the pectoral muscles? When the literature says that paravertebral block should be effective on its own, actually the understanding is based on your understanding of the anatomy of the, para, of the breast. The breast is not only supplied by the intercostal nerves, they also have supply from the cervical components, supraclavicular nerves, the pectoral nerves, and even from the contralateral side. So I think it raises the question, that if you perform pectoral nerve blocks, will it improve the, the quality of surgical anesthesia? A randomized study to answer this question is, is ongoing, and I can tell you that if you do a pectoral nerve block, the surgeon love it. And it's very difficult to blind the surgeons because they now know that when we do pectoral blocks, the patients don't behave like they used to. When they are operating on the breast, on the, on the pectoral muscle and the muscle contracts, you have, uh, you have um, patient reporting pain. Again, the pectoral nerves are described as pure motor nerves. If it's a pure motor nerve, why are we experiencing pain? If they're operating on the pectoral muscle, why are, you experience, why are the patients experiencing pain? Actually, there are no pure motor nerves in this body. If you look at any nerve, there are usually sympathetic and sensory fibers in this. So next time we meet, probably in Bangalore or in Hyderabad, I will share some of these experiences from the next year's work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kadvanka. Uh, since we'll be taking uh, questions at the end of the session, I think we'll now invite the second speaker. Okay. We'll uh, surely have something uh, for Dr. Karmakar later on. We now have Dr. Sandeep Devan from Miraj on SWAS compartment block. Dr. Diwan, please. Good evening, everybody. I hope you all had a lovely time here. And especially listening to Manoj, Sanjay Sinha, welcome all the way, Dr. Su Ganpati. Uh, we deal with lumbar plexus blocks or the source compartment blocks. All the pictures, videos are with the permission of the hospital and patients and relatives. Now, I c conduct routinely cadaveric dissections in uh, one of the uh, government hospitals in my place. 
Uh, we do a lot of, uh, uh, unfortunately, the anatomists, they don't perform this lumbar plexus dissection. So it's a boon to us. So I routinely perform this in, in every, uh, once in every six months. Uh, those yellow things are the lumbar roots, which uh, emerge from the foramen, and then they uh, transfers through the psoas muscle on the posterior aspect. The psoas major muscle has been reflected to show the, uh, the roots, which then intermingle with each, each other from L1 to L4. And as they emerge from the lateral side of the psoas major muscle, you can see the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the femoral nerve, and the lumbar sacral trunk. So you can see how distinct, distinctly these are placed away from each other, unlike the brachial plexus, which are very compact structures in the upper limb. Uh, one of the good studies, the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia mentioned the uh, placement of the lumbar plexus components, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the femoral nerve, and the, uh, the obturator nerve, which lie in separate muscular slips. They lie on the posterior aspect of the psoas muscle, just in front of the transverse process. So the target area for us when you use a lumbar plexus block is to hit the transverse process and go just beyond it into this psoas uh, muscle and try to identify the femoral nerve with the neurostimulation if you are using it and then deposit your drug in, these psoas, uh, in the psoas compartment. So that's why it's called as a psoas compartment. It's been called a psoas sheath block uh, and uh, at times it's called the lumbar plexus block. The anatomical landmarks are you identify the posterior superior iliac spine, you draw a line which ascends up, you draw an intercostal line, and the point of insertion of needle is the point of intersection of these two lines. So this is a, a, a technique which has uh, been popularized by Vinnie, and there are several others which have been uh, by Chelly and by Captivella. So this is what I uh, routinely use. You need to have a perfect knowledge of the, not of, only of the dermatomes, but of the osteotomes that uh, the nerve supplies. Because the femoral nerve, apart, uh, the, apart from the static nerve, it supplies the, the, uh, the shaft of the femur. And the entire uh, the tibial bone is supplied by the static nerve and a part uh, by the femoral nerve. So when you do, a, uh, when you do a, a lower limb block, you need to block both the the lumbar plexus as well as the sacral plexus to have a unilateral limb block. Now let's deal with the anatomical landmark technique when you use, when you don't have a neurostimulation. Initially in the past, I used to do only with uh, epidural needle with a loss of resistance technique. So how, how does this, uh, how does this hold good? Let's see. Now the anatomical landmark technique is, is with the loss of resistance is with a two hinge needle. The anatomical landmark are the same. You identify the posterior iliac spine. You ascend, the, uh, you ascend uh, the line goes up, and you draw the intercostal line. And the point of insertion is the point of intersection of this. The patient is in a sitting position. And most of these are done for the hip surgeries, and also for the knee surgeries. But uh, associated sacral plexus block may be necessary in this case. So the needle is placed through the skin, the subcute. The, um, the muscle of the back, and it hits the transverse process. Now, once you hit the transverse process, it's necessary for you to walk over the transverse process. At, at this point, you can attach the uh, loss of resistance syringe and try to identify, as you go beyond the transverse process, you f feel that the loss of resistance, the, just like as you go into the epidural space. At this point, you inject around 10 ml of 0.5% bupovacan, and then you can thread in your catheter. And after that, you can inject another 10 ml or 12 ml of your 0.5% bupivacan. Now, does the catheter really go into the, into the psoas compartment? Does it really block the lumbar plexus? For this, I usually do a contrast study because I'm always in the orthopedic theater, a small contrast, and the imaging techniques will identify that you are exactly in the lumbar plexus. You can also add a sacral plexus block in this case. This is the lateral view of the, uh, of the uh, of the lumbar plexus. The neurostimulation technique is based on the current which is delivered into, into the femoral nerve. The anatomical landmarks, they remain the same. When you identify the femoral nerve inside this lumbar plexus, you, the first thing what you see is the quadriceps contractions at one milliamperes. After having that, you then inject your local anesthetic at 0.4 milliamperes. So you start with a current of around 1 milliamperes, you come down to around 0.4 milliamperes, 
and then you inject around 20 ml or 25 ml of local anesthetic. Now, some of the Western studies have mentioned large volumes of local anesthetic for the lumbar plexus blocks, but in the Indian populations who are, who are thin and uh, not obese like the ones in the Western uh, area, so you can use around 20 ml. So that is the lumbar plexus, the posterior superior leg spine, and the iliac crest, and the insertion of needle. And this is the sacral plexus block where you join the line from the ischial tuberosity to the posterior superior leg spine. You divide in three parts, and you uh, you take 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 to insert the needle, upper third and the lower two thirds. Once you do that, you insert a needle vertically into the uh, uh, in, through the skin, the subcute, the gluteal muscles, and then the needle might hit or may not hit the sacral bone. You just go over it into uh, to just be in touch with the sacral plexus. At this point, you can have the sacral plexus stimulation, which which will uh, uh, the end point of which is either plantar flexion or dorsiflexion. Since the, both the nerves, tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve, they lie in the same sheath. At this, at this level, it doesn't matter at what, uh, what end point you have. You can have either plantar flexion or dorsiflexion at 0.4. You give around 20 ml of drug. And you can, you can, you can also perform the hip surgeries in, uh, in this case. And you can extend your uh, anesthesia and analgesia to the, even to the knee surgeries. Now, most of these patients are with some comorbid conditions. And these blocks, they, they, uh, they suit them. Now, this patient had a huge uh, new tumor which was fungating, and she had also comorbid conditions. Now, you can see the patellar dance along with the quadriceps contractions. This is the end point at 0.4 milliamperes in these patients. And you can also insert catheters here. If you use an 18 gauge um, stimulating needle, you can introduce the needle as well as you can inject the drug. And after injecting the drug and creating some space, then you can insert your catheters, which go right into the lumbar plexus. The end point is always at 0.4 milliamperes, 20 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine. It may be combined with zalokin, or 1.5%. Now, the knee is a structure which is supplied, uh, supplied by the femoral, the femoral nerve, the sciatic nerve, as well as uh, may or may not the op obturator nerve. That is the sacral plexus uh, block. Where I told you that you have, you have a point which is the upper third and the lower two thirds on a line which joins the posterior superior leg spine and the ischial tuberosity. You can see the dorsiflexion of the foot very nicely. You can also have the plantar flexion. If the needle is more, more medially, you can have a plantar flexion. If it's more laterally, you can, you can have the dorsiflexion of the foot. Now, most of these patients, they do require some sedation in the form of uh, mirazolam or fentanyl, mirazolam and fentanyl, and at times a small dose of ketamine. For the hip surgeries, usually I combine with a subcostal block where you can have with a loss of resistance or with an ultrasound, where you can insert your needle mid-axillary in midpoint between the, uh, the low, lowest rib and the iliac crest. Uh, this is the uh, above the amputation, and of course they are very anxious, and it, uh, they need some, uh, some sort of sedation, so always uh, some sedation and some, some, some sort of sedation is always given in this, in, in, in this kind of patients. You can also use stimulating catheters. Now these stimulating catheters, Dr. Sanjay must have already mentioned you about the stimulating catheters. The anatomical landmarks remain the same. The needle and the, uh, remains the same, but now you have a stimulating catheter where when, when you identify the lumbar plexus, the femoral nerve in the psoas compartment, you detach the, the neurostimulation uh, unit from the needle and you attach it to the, the catheter. And then you try inserting the catheter till you get maximum response at 0.4 or 0.6 milliamperes. If you still are having good responses, the cordyceps contractions, if you're still having that, then you can keep that going on. And once you have that, then uh, with a sufficient length inside, you can inject your local anesthetic and have the, uh, the, the catheter very well in place. Now, this is the, again the cordyceps contractions, the patellar dance, which you can very nicely see. Now, there was a paper by Dr. Su Ganupati who mentioned that almost 40% of the catheters, most of the times, they are outside the sheath. This way I had, I had studied when I inserted a femoral catheter 
infra-inguinal, and when we performed the supra-inguinal dissection, we found that the catheter was far away from where it was when it was introduced almost 20 centimeters at the inguinal crease. So it depends upon the length of the catheter, and this stimulating catheter, it helps in definitely identifying that you are still inside the perineural space. So this is the stimulating catheter, which uh, uh, already you must have uh, seen earlier. Now, this is how it, it's inserted. And when you, keep, when you keep on inserting and you neurostimulate at one milliamperes and then keep on inserting the catheter still further, you can see that the contractions still uh, persist. So I keep on inserting the catheter at the same time I see that the contractions still persist. And since we are in private practice, we have to do it all alone. We don't have the luxury of having people around us. So you need to keep on monitoring at all points and even the hemodynamics so it's necessary for you to monitor everything when you do, uh, when you do it alone. So at 0.4 milliamperes, if you're having good contractions, you can then, and at sufficient length, maybe at around six to seven centimeters inside the sheath, you can just keep the catheter there and inject your local anesthetic. Uh, if, uh, uh, <coughs> blocks can be also performed by ultrasound technique. You must have seen a lot of paper by Dr. Manoj, who has presented a lot of these papers. But the technique which I use is the probe placement, which is almost like an axial and oblique. And the anatomical landmarks are the same. The needle placement is the same. The only thing is that the probe is placed in that manner. To identify the vertebral body, you can see the transverse process. I started this in 2008. You can see the source major muscle. And at times, you could see the nerve roots. Not all the times you are able to identify the root. This is the stimulating needle which arise, arrives near the transverse process. You can hit the transverse process and then you can go over it and you can identify the uh, lumbar plexus again. So ideally when you use, a, you use an ultrasound, it's always better to combine <coughs> the neurostimulation with the ultrasound technique. And then you can see the spread of local anesthetic. There is a, lo there is a gush of um, uh, intramuscular flooding of the uh, local anesthetic. So in, in this case, what I did was I tried to see with an epidural needle if, uh, recently after doing lots of lumbar plexus with a neurostimulation <laughs> technique. Now once you uh, are hitting the transverse process, you can see the needle actually hitting the transverse process. <coughs> then what you do is that you just try to go over the transverse process or underneath. If you go over the transverse process, you can see the needle as well. But if you go beneath the transverse process, you may not be able to see the needle. Now once you are identifying the root, which is supposed to be, you inject your local anesthetic and then you, you can insert your catheter as well. But the, the thing is that without neurostimulation, <coughs> are you really close to the femoral nerve? Unless you inject the contrast, you are not able to identif uh, identify whether you, you are very close to the femoral nerve. So I, we did a couple of studies where I used two epidural <coughs> needles with an ultrasound and a lumbar plexus block, insert a catheter and then the post-op period, uh, you in, in inject your local uh, contrast and see whether you're in the, in, the, in the right place. So subcutaneous tunneling always because uh, when the patient comes out of the uh, anesthesia, keeps on moving and the, lumbar, uh, the, the catheter might come out. So this is how the, the contrast looks like. You can see the, the, it's very low down. This, uh, the insertion of the catheter is very low down and you can see the catheter going right high up into the uh, right high up into the uh, lumbar plexus, almost up to the, uh, almost up to the level of uh, L1. So it's exactly at that point. But I've seen often that if you perform it with a plain epidural needle without neurostimulation, many times you are very close to the root and there is the contrast spreads into the epidural space. So it's ideal to use a neurostimulation with an ultrasound for your lumbar plexus blocks. There are some of the contrast images. You can see that there is a segmentation over there. You can see that there is a sharp delineation, and you can, in the lateral, um, in the lateral X-ray, you can see again a very sharp delineation of the contrast spread. You can see the catheter going right into the psoas. That is where the uh, the, the lumbar plexus lies, in the posterior part of the psoas major muscle. And when you inject the contrast, it spreads wide, blocking the obturator nerve, the femoral nerve, and the lateral femoral uh, cutaneous nerve. I use most of the times for all these patients where you can see that ankylosing spondylosis, there's no chance that the you can use a spinal or an epidural in these cases. 
and you can perform this with the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus block, which is always must as an as an complementary. So these are the these are the uh, basic indications for the lumbar sacral plexus blocks. Thank you very much. We'll have the uh, discussion uh, after the end of the sessions after all the three lectures are over. So. Now I have the privilege of uh, inviting Dr. Suganda Ganpati for the last talk of the day and she is going to talk on tab block, rectus sheath block and quadratus lumborus block. Dr. Suganda, please. Is she around? Oh, there you are. from the communication I'm just going to show some videos and so I didn't prepare any formal talk unlike Manoj and Dr. Diwan so I brought a bunch of videos to show you and I talked my way through that to explain why I did what I did if that's okay with you okay and I've also got um, a couple of videos from Peter Hebbard to show you the difference okay uh, I'm going to start off with the tap block I'll show you Peter Hebert's subcostal block. How will I get it to come? It does come. Okay. And I'll take. Uh, okay. Uh, this is way back about four or five years ago when I wanted to introduce tap lock catheters in my system because I had an epidural hematoma. So I sent an email to Peter Hebert and he was at Izura and he gave me, he allowed me to borrow this video from him. What he is doing is um, he is coming in from the just lateral to the midline. He is going through the rectus abdominis muscle and he is trying to get under the rectus to go into the transverse abdominis plane. And I want you to look at the size of the needle and look at his dexterity. I really admired him. Okay? <coughs> this is done in the post-operative period. You can see the staples, patient is anesthetized. So he's advancing in the transverse abdominis plane. That was a 15 centimeter needle. And there is somebody who is hydrodissecting that area. So that is the tip of the needle. And he's still advancing in the transverse plane until the entire needle disappears under the skin in the transverse plane. Watch him do that. That is a subcostal transverse abdominis plane catheter. And then he will put in a regular epidural catheter and he will take out his needle. See, can you see? Almost the entire needle, all, all the way to the hub, he will insert. That means the needle is at the level, needle tip is at the level of the ilia crest, but traveling all the way along the transverse abdominis plane. And he is hydrodissecting that area with the local anesthetic, 0.5% ropivacaine. And once he has entered that space, he is going to remove the hub and then advance a catheter. <coughs> you can still see the needle hasn't gone all the way in. Okay. That requires dexterity. You try doing this in an awake patient, you can come to my institution for a job if you manage doing that. I tried it, but unfortunately, in an unanesthetized patient, the patients are kind of uncomfortable. So, and also I noted that I got a beautiful upper abdominal block because I got the T7 
T7 to T10 block, but I did not get the L1, L2 block or the T12, L1 block. So I said, okay, that didn't work. And I tried Dr. McConnell's single injection tab block. That didn't work in my hand because it produced just a band of anesthesia. I wanted a total cutaneous and subcutaneous analgesia. So what we did, we developed a system of putting this catheter in. It, some people felt it was a little bit of an overkill because I do four catheters. rests the back comfortably on a rolled blanket. A pre-procedural scan is done using a high-frequency linear probe starting just below the xyphosternum and moving subcostally. The transversus abdominis is traced until the probe edge is at the mid-axillary line. A skin mark is made for the needle puncture site. The probe is rotated 90 degrees parallel to the iliac crest to identify the transversus inferiorly, and the second needle entry point is marked. The patient is given mild sedation. The skin is prepped with antiseptic solution and draped. The 10 centimeter chewy needle connected to an extension tubing and 30 mils of local anesthetic is inserted after local infiltration. Can everybody hear the, the advanced as the plane narration? is distended prior to each advancement until the needle <coughs> tip is below the midpoint of the rectus. Now I'm under the rectus. That, that muscle is the rectus abdominis. I have hydrodissected under the, the rectus. That means I'm on the lateral is edge of the rectus. Via this needle. And the needle is taken out. I hope you observe that Ensure that one can inject the by the multi-orificial catheter and that all orifices are under the skin. A similar procedure is done with the probe tracking the transversus abdominis plane caudally parallel to the iliac crest. Madam, can you show the structures with the help of a pointer there on the screen? Yes. That would be better for the audience, I think. The catheter entry sites are sealed with dermabond and covered with transparent dressing. Play, can show. A rolled gauze over the tegaderm is fixed with Mefix to prevent major leak. The two catheters are connected using a Y connector to an elastomeric pump set <laughs> to deliver five mils per hour. A similar procedure is done on the opposite side. Okay, I'm going to play that again. You wanted me to show the structures. So. The patient is positioned in the lateral decubitus. Axillary <laughs> line, and the top lower limb is extended at the hip. The patient rests the back comfortably on a rolled blanket. A pre-procedural scan is done using a high-frequency linear probe starting just below the xyphosternum and moving subcostally. Okay. The transversus abdominis is traced until the probe edge is at the mid-axillary line. <clears throat> a skin mark is made for the needle puncture site. The probe is rotated 90 degrees parallel to the iliac crest to identify the transversus inferiorly and the second needle entry point is marked. Patient is given mild sedation. The skin is prepped with antiseptic solution and draped. The 10 centimeter chewy needle connected to an extension tubing and 30 mils of local anesthetic is inserted after local infiltration. The needle is advanced as the plane is distended prior to each advancement until the needle tip is below the midpoint of the rectus. This is, I'm still advancing it in the transversus plane. This is the transversus abdominis. The needle is getting advanced further. Once I re this is the rectus abdominis. 
All the nerves come from underneath the rectus abdominis <coughs> to enter the rectus abdominis to supply the, the multi orificial catheter. So my knee is inserted is via this under needle. the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis. Then I put my multi orificial catheter. I use 0.5% ropivacaine to distend the whole sheet. 20 cc on the top subcostal. Ensure that one can inject by the multi orificial catheter and that all orifices are under the skin. You should have no A similar procedure is done with the probe tracking the transversus abdominis plane caudally parallel to the iliac crest. So that is the internal oblique. This is the transversus abdominis. This patient is a little chubby, so the anatomy doesn't look that stellar. But it's so much better than some of the other patients I have done. Most of my patients have had previous surgeries. So the catheter entry sites are sealed with sealed. dermabond and okay. covered with transparent dressing. <clears throat> A rolled gauze over the tegaderm is fixed with Mefix to prevent major leak. The two catheters are connected using a Y connector to an elastomeric pump set to deliver 5 mils per hour. A similar procedure is done on the opposite side. Okay. Um, how much local anesthetic will I use? I will use 30 cc's per side. 20 cc's on the top subcostal area, 10 cc's for the bottom in uh, transversus plane, and a similar volume is used on the opposite side. If my patient is less than 65 kilos, I'll dilute this ropivacaine to 0.4%. I will still have an area on the anterolateral <coughs> abdomen where I may not perceive a block. But right in the midline, when I check from the nipple area all the way to the groin, I got blocked between T8 and T12, sometimes even to L1, occasionally up to T7. And I'll put the patients on a PCA along with this, and the patients will ping the button maybe about five, six, seven times during the first 12 hours. After that, they won't ping the button at all, and I'll discontinue my PCA. And I continue this for about three days, and the patients took very little narcotics with multimodal analgesia. I know it is not as perfect as epidural, but I can't get an epidural hematoma with this. I can do it in a patient who is kind of moderately anticoagulated. The only group of people I will not do it in is if the patient has got hepatic insufficiency because they can't deal with the local <coughs> anesthetic load because they can get toxic. The second group of people that I won't do it in is if they are so wasted I cannot get into the plane and remain in the plane consistently. Sometimes I will see a loop of bowel come through the whole thing where a previous ostomy had been performed. Those are the patients when I do the pre-procedural scan, I can identify and I wouldn't do this procedure. So it's, it, this was my first rescue if I cannot do an epidural or the epidural was unsafe in my patient or the patient refuses epidural. This works well for the vertical incision it is a no-go for the subcostal incision, okay? So how else can you do the tap block? There is something called the lateral approach to tap block. This is again from Peter Hebert. I'm grateful to him. He has marked it already. <coughs> external oblique, internal oblique. This is anterior, this is posteri posterior. And he's coming from the front and he's getting into the transversus abdominis plane. He's going to inject. He's advancing his needle further. He's going to advance the needle all the way to the back. So he's doing it from front to back, hoping that whatever he delivers tracks along that plane, goes into the paravertebral space is what they are saying. So I went back to my anatomy lab to look at, can it go to the paravertebral space? I can say with confidence, it does not. So for it to go to the paravertebral space, you have to use probably a much more posterior approach that's where the quadratus lumborum block comes in handy because you're delivering the drug more posteriorly. So I'm going to show you some anatomy related to that. So that's a cross-section of the abdomen. What is the quadratus lumborum block? All the nerves come out through the intervertebral foramen and then travel in front of the quadratus lumborum. I thought they were traveling superficial to the fascia of the quadratus lumborum. Now I do believe it travels under the fascia of the quadratus lumborum. In the few cases I have done, when I delivered my drug superficial or just anterior to the quadratus lumborum fascia, my block failed. But when I went in from <coughs> here, delivered it under the fascia of the quadratus lumborum, I had a successful block. And as soon as I have done the block, which I'll use about 20, 25 cc's of local anesthetic per side, I may not have an extensive block. I may have somewhere between 
T8 to T12, T11. And then as I infuse, continue to infuse, by the next morning when I go to see the patient, I can have a T4 to L1 block. So obviously, gradually, it proximally tracks and gets the inter intercostal nerves. Okay, so I'll show you another picture to give an idea as where exactly is this quadratus lumborum muscle. So if you look at it, these are the <coughs> abdominal, external, internal, and transversus abdominis. This is the transversus abdominis. That is the transversalis fascia. This is quadratus lumborum just above the ilia crust. And these nerves are shown in Netter's atlas to be traveling just anterior to the quadratus lumborum. But this picture does not tell you whether it is behind the sheath of the quadratus lumborum or anterior to the sheath of the quadratus lumborum. I believe they are behind the sheath of the quadratus lumborum from the few patients I have done. And I'm going to, sh and then I went <coughs> according to what some of the others had done. They come from the lateral side, so maybe I'll go get that picture again. They come from the lateral side, go through the uh, transversus abdominis muscle, put their needle anterior to the transversalis fascia, close to the quadratus lumborum. And they claim that they've got a block between T4 and T12. <coughs> so when I did that, that I call as the lateral to medial approach, I just had the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, and subcostal anesthetized. I never had any proximal spread at all. So what we did, we came back and repeated the block for that patient in the recovery room back again after evaluating how far the block had spread. And I'm going to show you how it looks. <coughs> my images are not fantastic because I was playing with my new machine. Okay, so that is my needle coming. Okay, this is the internal transversus abdominis. <coughs> this is the transversalis fascia. So I'm coming, coming through the internal oblique. I'm going to go through the transversus abdominis to deliver my drug somewhere in this <coughs> location. And this area is my quadratus lumborum. That muscle is the uh, latissimus dorsi. Not latissimus dorsi. Yeah, latissimus dorsi. So if I deliver my drug there, I just got T12 L1 <coughs> block. So when you are doing the quadratus lumborum block, that is not where you want to deliver the drug. So I call this the medial <coughs> to lateral approach. Now the needle is coming from the medial side. This is my quadratus lumborum. You can see the sheath of the quadratus lumborum, and you can see the transversalis fascia there. So we are coming from there. I'm going through the quadratus lumborum, and you will see me deliver my drug around the quadratus lumborum when it shines a little bit better. It's very grainy. I'm sorry about that, but that's as best as I could get it. This patient also was quite chubby. It was a BMI of 40. So now it is still coming. Once I inject, you will see the delineation of the quadratus lumborum much better. There we go. So that is a quadratus lumborum, which looks a little bit more clearer. And my drug is delivered here. And then what we did, we did a color Doppler to see where I have delivered the drug. And color Doppler reveals that I am pretty <coughs> anterior to the quadratus lumborum in the preperitoneal fat probably. That's where I got my patient to develop a block between T5 to L1. So obviously quadratus lumborum block could be a good rescue, good alternative to thoracic epidural. You have to do it bilaterally, unilateral doesn't help. And it will also get the visceral peritoneum. So that is another advantage. It is an extension of the um, tap block but the drug can track back along the nerve sheath to the paravertebral area. And uh, I'm going to just show you the rectus abdominis. In my hospital, I, I did learn to do the rec rectus block. I have given it, conceded it to my surgeons. Most of the time for spiddly little umbilical hernia or a small incisional hernia, I don't believe I need to invade. My surgeon infiltrates the whole area beautifully and that lasts quite nicely. When they go for more major surgery, when the patient hasn't had an epidural, what my surgeon will do, he will put in a needle, epidural needle coming from the top. He will position it in the posterior rectus sheath under direct vision. One of my surgeons put a pediatric feeding tube there. Nowadays, I've given them a nice block kit. They will put a multi-orificial catheter and that will be wide, one on each side. Initial dose will be 
20 cc's per side or 0.5% ropivacaine, and the infusion rate will be 10 cc's per hour or 0.3% ropivacaine, and these patients don't use any narcotic postoperatively. And this is 100% success rate, and I'm not worried about that entering any vessel. I don't waste my surgeon's time trying to put it after the patient has had surgery, because after the patient has had surgery, for me to introduce this block ultrasonographically is a nightmare. Really close to the incision, my ultrasound images are just, I, I don't want to use the bad word, that it, you can't identify structures very clearly. So I get my surgeon to put in. That is as far as the rectus sheath block from my side is concerned. For little ones, you can come from the lateral side, inject under <coughs> the rectus abdominis, but I don't believe for piddly little things I need to invade. My surgeon has a much higher success rate of infiltrating the edges, so I don't, I haven't, my incidence of rectus sheath block are very, very low. So that's as far as the rectus sheath is concerned. I'm sorry I'm not giving you any formal lecture like the others did, because I thought I was just going to share the videos and chat it out and you can ask me questions if you have any questions. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Suganda. Uh, I do hope that the audience has enjoyed uh, the video presentations which she had showed, but sure enough, they would have generated some questions. So I will now request all the three speakers to please come on the dais for one last time before we finish this day. And, uh, well, all the three papers are open to questions. Before that, I think before we open it for the audience, I would like to say something and uh, pardon me in saying that not more than 20% of the people who are sitting here have ultrasound machines with them. And uh, I, I don't want to say that yes, ultrasounds are not needed, these are the uh, this, these machines are the need of the hour now, but uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Karmakar first, uh, do you have any message for those in relation to thoracic parabatural block, uh, especially those who are not having ultrasound machines? Uh, I think there are, there are several techniques of performing percutaneous paravertebral blocks because the theme was how do I do it? So. If it was thoracic paravertebral block, then maybe I would have taught you how to do, you know, um, landmark-based techniques. But landmark-based techniques are, are relatively simple to, to learn. Uh, the, the safety of these techniques are, are, are established. And more importantly, I think uh, if you work in centers where, as Professor Ganapati said, if you can embrace your surgeons to come on board, uh, especially when you do thoracic surgery, uh, you can get your surgeons to place retropleural catheters, which is basically uh, paravertebral catheters. And this is a well-established method where we do thoracic surgery where before the days of uh, ultrasonography, we would do uh, a possibly uh, a T4 to T5 paravertebral single shot 20 cc injection after the patient is turned lateral and you have decompressed the lung. While the surgeons are scrubbing up, we just do a single shot injection. Uh, and because by and large, most centers today are doing video assisted thoracoscopic surgery. So if it is a single shot injection, the thoracoscopic surgery, uh, it usually covers most of the segments for the, the three ports that are there. And sometimes you may have to do two level injections at T3 and T5 to cover the entire, entire spectrum. But if they do convert it to a thoracic thoracotomy, a posterior lateral or even a modified thoracotomy to deliver the, the lobe or the lung, then you can get the surgeon to, percut, uh, to place it under direct vision by dissecting the pleura uh, or re placing it retropleurally th through, the, through the chest. So there are techniques that are described and the surgeons are, are quite familiar with that in most centers and there are many published uh, data on that. So if you are, uh, are wishing to learn paravertebral blocks, then I think of course, you have to go and see it being done somewhere, and there are, I think, many experts in this audience who do it in their regular practice. Next is, if you work in a center, as I said, who you, where you do card, uh, thoracic surgery, then I think you must uh, rely on the surgeons putting uh, percut, uh, surgically placed catheters in conjunction with your single shot, single level or multi-level injection. Thank you. It's open for the house now. Uh, 
uh, yes, asking your surgical colleagues to infiltrate, I too tried to do that. And when they infiltrate in the rectus sheath, most of the drugs flow out while they inject. So the local anesthetic that I calculate and give them, it flows out through the wound while they are injecting, <coughs> right in front of our eyes. So anything that can be done for that? Actually, this uh, cannulation is done by the surgeon under direct vision at the very end. He will put in the cannula. He won't inject right away. Okay. He injects after he closes the rectus sheath and the midline incision. Otherwise, whatever he injects will come out through the medial hole because the whole sheath is open. And that's what happens when you do the wound infiltration for the subcostal incision. So, and so it, it doesn't work when the sheath is open. So they have to put the catheter in under, di under direct vision. They can, in case it's a paramedian incision, they can put the needle from the top and they can feel it with their hand. That is, it is under the rectus, rectus muscle. Then put the catheter in there and connect it. And then after they close the abdomen, they inject. Okay, uh, actually that is what I wanted to ask you, you know, how do they insert a feeding tube? From where are they? In? You said you give them a feeding tube, so uh, it, it, I just wa uh, wanted to know where do they insert it from? You know, is it through the incision or is it from a separate no. uh, injection? They make a skin neck and then they can, they have got dilators they can put in and then put they put the, the feeding tube and they pick it up with the snap and bring it into the rectus sheath and lay it over and close the rectus sheath and inject through the feeding tube. I do not recommend it. This was one of the surgeons, Irish surgeons. He kept on asking me to put in these catheters and I was lagging behind. He got fed up with me. He said, I'm going to do it my way. And one fine morning, I get a call from the floor. What is this stuff through feeding tube through which we are giving ropivacaine? Can you come and tell me what block it is? Then I realized that's what it was. So now I give them a formal needle catheter insertion system for them to put it in. I Hello. believe they do it in uh, Ireland uh, because uh, we have this uh, liver surgeons who do the, uh, for the uh, hepatectomy. They have the subcostal block and they put in this uh, kind of catheter um, like that, you know, like they want to tunnel it. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure whether where they'll put it and uh, whether they can actually feel the tap plane. No, uh, I don't believe so. I, it, 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 it would be, it would not be possible. So that's why I wanted to know if it's, uh, if, if you think it's feasible, then I can, you know, like. He told me the same thing. If you look at the transversus abdominis, either with the ultrasound or when they have dissected, it is paper thin. Most of my patients haven't exercised their belly in the longest time along with their anesthetist. So it is really, really thin. So for them to say, oh, I can feel the pop, it's imagination. They might be superficial to the external oblique, superficial to the internal oblique, or maybe superficial to the transverse. They claim that it works like a charm, but I don't believe. They did it, some of them, I went back and tested them in the post-op period. No, that is not true. It's a mis misinformation as far as I'm concerned. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, madam, uh, if you're putting a continuous tap catheters, uh, if you are putting for a subcostal catheters, they, what, what should be the direction of the needle, how you are putting catheter, it is from medial to lateral or lateral to medial, that is first. Second question is, uh, what catheter you actually are using? Are you using epidural catheters or different catheters like multi-hole uh, catheters? And what is the infusion rate you will keep if you put a, a tap catheters? Oh, for the tap catheters, okay, fine. Um, for the tap catheters, the initial injection I use is 0.5% ropivacaine. I use 0.35% ropivacaine. That will be 5 cc's per side. It's an elastomeric pump. So it will automatically give 5 cc's per hour on either side. Those are not perfect pumps. So although you expect it to last 48 hours, it may last about 52, 55 hours. So it probably underperforms a little bit. But doesn't matter, it works. So you don't have to be precise with what you're infusing. Why did I choose 0.35%? I tell my nurses to document sensory block. When I used 0.2%, even I couldn't document sensory block, whether it is eyes or uh, blunt needle. 
So I wanted some level of block so that the nurses can tell me, oh, there is some difference there, so there is some amount of block. That's the only reason. If you're worried about local anesthetic toxicity, go for 0.2%, but you may need a larger volume. With elastomeric pumps, for me to increase the volume, the maximum I can give is only 5 cc's. You don't have to use the elastomeric pump. You can go for a regular cat prism pump or whatever you use for your regular epidural infusions. You can go as high as you want. And the second thing with, I wish to mention about the infusion, many people will say, uh, from Australia to, when I went to WCRAPT, they told me they don't run infusions because it doesn't maintain the span of expansion, extent of block. So they intermittently inject through the catheter. I do not like intermittent injections for the simple reason each injection could be a potential uh, toxicity as well as infection. And I hate infections. If you have one infection and you don't want to see another one, it's very ugly. And our interventions are what I call as luxury interventions. It should not risk the patient's life. So what is the direction, madam? You, if, you put it, uh, if you put it a tap catheter yes. for subcoastal, how is your direction of the needle? Do you, From do you lateral to medial. That is another advantage which I forgot to mention. The way that uh, Peter Herbert does it, he comes from the rectus sheath area, from the zippy sternum area, all the way to the ilia crest. And if I put it preoperatively, the surgeon says, what the heck is it? And they come and pull it out on me. And if I were to do it postoperatively, I need about 15, 20 minutes to put in, or at least 30 minutes, if not more. And that is added to the surgical time. Any time added to the surgical time, when they try booking the same case back again, the computer will not let them put book for the duration of surgery that they did. Now Canada is very particular. They look at our timings like a hawk. So if I added half an hour, they say, don't do that. My patient can have some pain. Is what what is the type do. of catheter you use? Pardon? Type of catheter you use. Type, it, it, I buy a kit. I got Payan Company to make this kit for me. The 10 centimeter needle is a um, echogenic needle, so I can see myself go in the plane well. And it is a vertebral blocks uh, for uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies, and uh, we have given some 20 blocks. Uh, could you speak uh, in into the mic, please? Pardon? Could you speak into the mic? We can't hear you well here. Yeah, it's regarding paravertebral blocks for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, after giving some 20 blocks in two patients, we yes. got contralateral paraesthesia. Uh, what is the reason for that? There we saw the good spread and uh, everything was visible. Are you saying uh, contralateral anesthesia or contralateral? Yeah, contralateral anesthesia. Oh, contralateral anesthesia is well described after, after unilateral paravertebral blocks. There are various mechanisms. How to prevent it? Uh, I would urge you to go and read some of my articles uh, on this uh, in, in region anesthesia pain medicine. But uh, I think uh, in a nutshell, you're injecting into the paravertebral area. Right. Uh, the routes that uh, it, the drug can follow are, are, are numerous, multi-directional. It can go into the epidural space and onto the contralateral side through the contralateral intervertebral foramina. So you, you may not have an epidural anesthesia, but you have an ipsilateral anesthesia with a contralateral segmental block in a few segments. So it's usually very close to the side of in, site of injection. So if you're injecting, say, T67 or T78 in your cholecystectomy, then you may find that on the contralateral side, a few segments, 6, 7, 8, or 8 is involved. There is also a route via the pre-vertebral route. The drug can track to the contralateral side via the anterior, uh, via the posterior mediastinum. Okay. And that is, the, uh, that is a route that is often most common, uh, in my opinion, because uh, there's loose uh, adipose tissue, uh, and it is through this that the local anesthetic can get to the contralateral side. So it is not uncommon. It can occur in as high as 15% of individual, especially if you do a single shot, a large volume injection at one, at one side. Manoj, you mentioned about the subendothoracic fascia, which divides into two, the extra pleural, and is it that we invade the subendothoracic fascia and then the drug it goes on the contralateral side? No, I think uh, 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 unless you have an understanding of the paravertebral anatomy and the various compartments, it's very complex to explain. That's why I said you must read the anatomy first. 
but what Dr. Diwan is saying is if there are two compartments in the paravertebral space, uh, there is the pleura and behind is the ligament. Uh, like the uh, abdomen has a transversus abdomini, uh, transverse, transversalis fascia, right? That is the deep fascia of the abdomen. You have a <coughs> endothoracic fascia, which is the deep fascia of the thorax. It is a retropleural fascia, and it is anterior to this posterior ligament. So uh, you can see that there are two compartments, so potential areas. But the endothoracic fascia is a very flimsy membrane. We have looked at it in cadavers. We have looked at it in, uh, in, uh, in, in situ when they do thoracotomy. It's not a, like a, a sheet that you can peel off. It is, a, uh, it is more uh, uh, a connective tissue matrix of, of, uh, of tissue. So that although in principle, in the diagrams I draw and I say that this may be a mechanism, but I think in reality uh, it probably doesn't happen because uh, it, it would not have the, the the, the resistance to resist the force of injection or the spread of the drug. Uh, thank. Um, Just one. I, I did uh, dry green grass technique of multi-segment paravertebral blocks, popping under the transverse process for breast surgery. Then, when I started doing paravertebral catheters for my cardiac. When I did the just popping under the superior costal transverse ligament, I had a very segmental block. It didn't cover the entire thing. So what I did, I advanced my epidural needle further till I felt another subtle pop. Then I had great loss of resistance. When I put in my catheter, I noted that my catheter tip was on the lateral border of the vertebrae. That means I was in the anterior compartment. Then I had, if I injected 20 cc's, I had at least six, seven segments on the ipsilateral side, but the, uh, whatever I have injected go through the prevertebral fascia <coughs> to the opposite side, I'll have three segments blocked on that side. I took some MRI pictures and I know for certain that's what happens when I'm in the anterior compartment. There were a couple of patients when I wasn't happy with my analgesia when I did that, I had a segmental, almost like an intercostal block because I covered only one paravertebral segmental area. I wasn't in the vertically communicating anterior compartment. That's the difference. That's what uh, he talks about in his anatomy. But I think uh, it's very important to understand when you uh, insert a thoracic paravertebral needle, which is a two-way needle eventually, uh, it's a traditional, unlike the ultrasound, in a, in a landmark technique, you're going paramedian, it's a sagittal needle insertion. Uh, and you're going uh, at right angles to the transverse process, then you go underneath the transverse process of kephalad. Uh, it seems like going underneath uh, is better than above now. Today we have some data. Uh, when you insert the catheter, it's not as easy as uh, inserting an epidural catheter. So this is a telltale sign you are in the paravertebral space. And if you insert too long a catheter, it will override the body of the vertebra. Uh, we see this during thoracoscopic surgery when we uh, have uh, decompressed the lung and I put a catheter and I try to thread the catheter. I often see it is abutting onto the lateral side of the vertebral body. And if you pass enough, push enough, it goes onto the anterior side. So that would result in a maybe a, um, less efficacious block. So what is the optimal length of catheter in the paravertebral space is not known. If you put too little, it will fall out. If you put too much, it will enter the intervertebral foramina or it'll go anterior to the vertebra. So in my clinical advices, you should not put more than three centimeters of catheter and secure it well, tunnel it well. The other clinical pearl for you is, if you are able to pass a catheter very freely, it usually means interpleural placement. Now, it's not a bad thing after, at the end of the day because interpleural analgesia is also effective. So um, if you are able to pass miles and miles of catheter, as I say, it usually telling you, it's telling you that it's an intraperural catheter, so treat it like an intraperural analgesia as opposed to a paravertebral analgesia. Well, thank you. With that, uh, thanks to all the three eminent speakers and uh, my co-chairperson, Dr. Sethi, who would like to close this session. And before we leave the dais, I must once again compliment and thank the organizers for having done a wonderful job. It's back to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, chairpersons and doctors.
Uh, we will now have a small award uh, ceremony for the people who have uh, presented papers and e-posters. Um, for the best oral paper, I would first like to call upon the four judges who have judged these presentations. Dr. Bishnu Panigrahi, Dr. Nikki Sabarwal, Dr. M. Rupinder Singh, and Dr. Raminder Sehgal. We don't have the other two doctors here. Well, I don't know. Dr. Raminder I think hasn't come today. Okay. Rupinder was here. And Dr. Rupinder Singh, is he here? She, she, she. Oh, she. she. Is she here? She's not in the hall. She's not. So may I request the both of you to please announce the winners? We need the result. We need the result. You need the result? Yes. The result was to be compiled. Yeah. I apologize. I thought they were already with you. <laughs> so the first prize is to Dr. Surajit Giri. Surajit Giri, a no, no, novel approach to ileoguinal and ileohypogastric nerve block using peripheral nerve stimulator for hernia surgery. Please. He'll introduce. He'll tell us. Come, come, come. He's from Ship Sagar. <laughs> Ship Sagar Asa. The first prize is actually 200 Canadian dollars that have been donated by Dr. Sukanta Ganapati. Okay, the, the second prize goes to Dr. Malika Malindra. Uh, from Sri Guru Ram Das Institute of Medical Sciences, Amritsar. The title was to evaluate the effect of adding dexmedetomidine to uh, levobibacaine in supraclavicular brachial plexus block in upper limb surgeries. Dr. Malika. Is she here? Is Dr. Malika here? Yeah, okay, come on. So the second prize uh, for the best uh, presentation is a free registration for the conference and the workshop uh, next year at Bangalore. And this has been done by Dr. T.V.S. Gopal. Third is Dr. Vinita he... S.K. from uh, B.L. Kapoor Memorial Hospital, New Delhi. It's on ultrasound and guided thoracic vertebral, paravertebral block for breast cancer surgery. The third prize is a free registration for the conference and uh, also some scientific uh, video matter that has also been given by Dr. Uh, Ganapati. And uh, let me please reiterate that uh, the second prize, the free registration for the conference and the workshop has been uh, organized specially by Dr. TVS Gopal. And for the third prize, the 
uh, free registration for the conference has been done by the organizing team this year. That is the team from Forest Memorial. We, we now move on to the e-poster. Uh, the judges for this were Dr. Dash. May I please invite him on stage? Dr. P. N. Kakkar and Dr. Jagdish Sahane. May I request you both to please announce the three prizes? The first prize goes to Dr. Vibhuti Sharma from Sabdajang Hospital. The book that she has been given is Hasdik's Peripheral Nerve Blocks. This is the second edition and this has been sponsored by one of the sponsors here, Bibron. The second prize goes to Dr. Prachi Surwe. Is Dr. Prachi around? The name of the institution is not mentioned. So I think one of the judge can take the prize. <laughs> well, <clears throat> That's very interesting because the second prize for this also is the free registration uh, for the conference and the workshop in Bengaluru next year. So you can also announce sponsored. the judges' names. That so you have to decide between the both of you who wants no, you, that. You have to announce it. <laughs> <laughs> the third prize goes to Dr. Abhishek, once again from Sabdajang Hospital. Lovely. In this category as well, the third prize is a free registration for the conference in Bangalore next year and scientific uh, CDs that have been uh, donated by Dr. Ganpati. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. Uh, today's session ends here. Tomorrow's uh, workshops will be held at Fortis Memorial Research Institute in Gurgaon. Uh, you have already been given, they start at 8 a.m. in the morning and uh, you can take the metro from I think the, those directions have been given to everyone. You can take the closest metro, which is the central secretariat. Am I right? Then I shouldn't give out wrong information. <laughs>